Um, and that's, there's a website where you can find out more, and it's in the East Madrone Room in uh, Martin Luther King Center. On Thursday night, Peace Corps is very challenging. My son just finished up two years of the Peace Corps and uh, decided to stay in his country, which was Nicaragua. So also he got married. So it just shows you some of the things that can happen when you uh, join the Peace Corps. Uh, this doesn't happen to all Peace Corps volunteers, but uh, some. Um, other announcement is that the website that I told you about before, www.metacenter.org, is now fully operational. Uh, let me put it up here. This isn't our class, right? Uh, and we hope to Meta Center that it would be very useful for people like you in this class. And so if you have other, you know, if you see things that it should have or things are unclear, uh, we want this to be interactive. And there's a, there's a blog and there's a way that you can – this is the 21st century – so you can get back to us and uh, let us know how it's working for you. And in addition to a website, we also have fantastic T-shirts. So I hope we're getting – are we getting this on the webcam? <laughs> <laughs> and this is going to be uh, a bumper sticker also that you can send back to your folks. So let me get redressed here for the rest of the <laughs> – uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about something that came up last time. I think I made a mistake. There was a question about uh, are we – we American citizens vis-a-vis -vis the war in Iraq, are we in an emergency situation of the type that we we're describing in this class? And I got carried away and said yes, but th it's not true. There, there we are not in a situation which requires the use of violence. We're not there yet. We have two audiences. Th the general public, which can still be reached by education, especially now, Let's not make any mistakes about the general public in the U.S. right now. They, what they are experiencing is not a revulsion against war. They are not against war. They are against losing. And what, But we can take this energy, this consciousness, momentum, and turn it to an anti-war consciousness. And that should be done by normal means of persuasion. But in terms of reaching – oh, very good. Okay. In terms of reaching policymakers, they cannot be persuaded. They already told us that. I remember a dire rebate in my town. Well, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. As you probably have guessed, we're going to see a film in a little while. Uh, policymakers are very pr have proudly announced that they cannot be reached by reason. So the reason I got excited and said, yes, yes, this is an emergency, is because of my famous model. Can we get the sideboard on the camera if I – okay. Of uh, course – ah, here it is. I'll tell you what, let's just do it here and we'll put it under the Meta Center. Yeah. As all of you know because you've already read my book, on page 108 of that book, I make an attempt to – be perceived as a scientist in vain hopes of being fully funded and getting the Nobel Prize at some point. And I have this famous diagram of the escalation of conflict and how it proceeds smoothly, but you can, for purposes of knowing how to react nonviolently, it's convenient to divide it into three phases. And the first phase is you, what you might call the head phase where people can be persuaded by reason. And that's the phase we're in is regarding much of the general public, which is confused, see nothing but advertising all day long, and they don't know where to go. They could be reached by reason and, and passion and argumentation. And high school debate coaches know all about this. But there comes a stage, and Gandhi was very clear about this, when reason just doesn't work anymore. And then you need satyagraha, and that we might call the heart region because he said things of fundamental importance cannot be gained through appeals to reason al alone. They cannot be gained through petition. You have to be able to move the heart also. And I find it convenient to designate a still a third stage where things have gone so far 
you have been so dehumanized in the eyes of your opponents, the people you're trying to persuade, awaken, that you really have to lay down your life. You have to risk your life. Um, it doesn't mean you have to die, but it does mean you have to be prepared to die. And that gives you a certain amount of power. I'm fond of describing uh, – and A students will forgive me for repeating this ad nauseam, but one of my best friends, uh, Dan Ellsberg, is a person who released the Pentagon Papers. And he was sitting there with those papers which would show the country that the president was lying about the Vietnam War. He was sitting there with those papers and asking himself the question, what will happen to me if I go public with these? And when he asked that question, he conjured up all kinds of horrible things that would happen to him and he got paralyzed and he couldn't do it. But one day, mostly under the gentle persuasion of Patricia Ellsberg, instead of putting the question that way, he said to himself, what could I do if I were willing to go to jail? And that immediately opened it up. He said, oh, I could do this, I could do that. I could." And the next thing you knew, he was walking across the street with those 70,000 pages and released, putting them out in Xerox copies to all the major newspapers. So what I'm saying is not that you want to die, but there's a great deal of power that comes from your willingness to die. And in terms of this administration, we're somewhere about here, I would say, on this. So it needs direct opposition and concrete uh, measures. Yeah, there's a seat right back there. Um, so I don't think that we're in a state where we need to use violence. That's only in extreme last-minute physical emergencies. And it's interesting that Gandhi, who, f who invented this idea that it would be nonviolent to dispatch a lunatic with a sword who's rushing through the village, he invented this idea in 70 – he lived to be about 78. He worked probably 60 years in the forefront of nonviolent action never had to invoke this principle. He never had to actually do it. So it's just there theoretically so that you know a point can come way up on the curve where you have to uh, even use lethal force. But it's, it's interesting to know about theoretically, but it doesn't really – it's not a model for us. You don't need to worry about it. Yeah? That's even past Satyagra. I'm saying sacrifice for this part out here. But even here, do note that this has nothing to do with that uh, lunatic with the sword either because I'm not talking about killing somebody. I'm talking about being ready to die. Do you remember that famous line in the movie? When I say the movie up to the end of January, it means the Attenborough's Gandhi movie. What's going to change in February is that a friend of mine has done a major documentary on Abdul Ghaffar Khan and it's going to be screened in somewhere in L.A. in February and I'm going to – See if I can wheedle her with persuasion. In <laughs> I won't – probably won't have to go on a hunger strike, but I'd like to get her to let us have the front up here. So anyway, in the movie, you remember in that famous scene in the uh, September 11th, 1906, the Empire Theater, Gandhi – that what he actually said uh, is not accurate in the movie, but it's, it's true to type where he says, I too – I'm willing – this is a cause for which I too am willing to die, but there is no cause for which I am willing to kill. So that's a whole separate thing. It's not even on this chart. Okay, so the, I, got a, I got excited and nervous and went over to the chart. But what I should have said was no. This is not that kind of emergency for any of us yet. Now on this – yeah, question. No, as I say, that would be off this chart. This, this would be such an extreme emergency that I have to use lethal force in order to protect life. And uh, I've been putting this out there. There's plenty of lun lunatics in Berkeley. Any one of them could have taken me up on it and tried, you know, come into the class uh, with a gun, but they never have. So what I'm saying is it's very unlikely that that would ever happen. Now, when people hear about that deranged lunatic exception, they say, well, that's what we're doing with war, right? The country's attacked. Suddenly, you go and defend it. But no, because you had to do a huge lot of preparation. 
to get that defense ready. Now, if you had time to prepare, you have a choice to prepare violence or nonviolence. And Gandhi actually wanted India to be prepared to resist what they thought was an impending Japanese invasion by nonviolent means. So we'll talk about exactly how that would work later on in the semester. But it, this, it occurred to me that there's an interesting uh, model here. We're never going to get through everything I want to say, but at a, at a key point, I will stop and we'll see the film. Uh, if you compare two cases, we were comparing Algiers and India, the same, they were very similar insurrections, but one of them used nonviolence and the other used violence, roughly speaking. The one that used nonviolence, very, very low rate of injury and very, very good relationship with the previously colonial country, namely Britain. Whereas in Algiers, you had a drastic number of people killed and the relations between the Algerians and the French are not all that great even to this day. And Algiers is not a democracy, which has something to do with the fact that they chose violence as a means of liberating themselves from colonial rule or anything else. So that was a good kind of comparison. <laughs> now I want to throw out another comparison here. Uh, when Gandhi was in Switzerland in 1931, he, he made public what he called this Thermopylae model. Thermopylae was a battle in the history of ancient Greece where a small force of uh, Peloponnesian soldiers tried to prevent an enormous Persian army from coming through the pass at Thermopylae and invading Greece. And they became great heroes. There's a poem of – I knew I shouldn't have started this. <laughs> There's a two-line poem of Simonides which goes, Oak, Sane, Angelane, Hati, Angelane, Patilaka, Daimoni, Ois, Hati, Heide, Kameth, Akane, Hippo, Ramus, Ipeta, Manoi. O friend who passes by my grave tomb here, go and report back to the Lacedaemonians that we lie here in obedience to their commands. Those were the Lacedaemonian soldiers who died at that pass. Okay, so that's our, our literary lapse for the week. We've got that out of our system. Let's go back to the model. Gandhi he invokes this saying that if the Japanese were to invade India or if someone were to invade your country, what you can do is go up to the border, men, women, and children, and stand there and try physically to resist them. Then people would say, but the, you know, they'd get killed. He said, yes, you'd get killed. But any army that – killed unresisting men, women, and children, he said, would not be able to repeat the experiment. Thank you. In other words, they'd be so revolted by their own behavior that they wouldn't be able to do that again. You say, this is drastic. This is costly. Can't help it. <laughs> you know, they're, they're invading our country. This is a drastic emergency. On the other hand, in commenting on the Polish defense in, I guess, 1940 when the Germans invaded Poland, the Polish army made a spirited attempt to defend the country and Gandhi was asked, <coughs> asked how he felt about that and he said, I'm willing to call this almost nonviolence. Why? Because the Poles knew that they would be crushed to atoms. There were absolutely no, res no match for the invading Wehrmacht. But they decided it was more honorable to go down fighting than to just give up their country. So he called that almost nonviolence and he's calling a Thermopylae defense nonviolence. Um, what, what do you think makes for the difference between the two cases? This is, this is kind of subtle. Yeah, Abby. I think in a way they did not have the choice or to put it in another way, they didn't know they had that choice. If you don't know that nonviolence is a possibility, then basically it's not available for you and you've got to use the next best thing. And as we know, violence is better than cowardice. I must have said that about a dozen times last semester. And so you – that he had, a, he had admiration, not just grudging admiration, but real admiration for what the Poles had done. But if he had been able to get into that country, say, a year before the 
German invasion and start talking about nonviolence, it would have been a very different story. Then you would have had what you had in Moscow in 1991 where they prevented the coup attempt through nonviolent means. And the journalists all said, oh, this is amazing. Where did this come from? We never heard of it. What lucky thing. Well, I have a friend, as you probably know, who was in Russia doing two nonviolence workshops a day, every day all summer before that thing happened. So it was not luck. It was training. But that's the difference. In the Thermopylae case, he's talking to people with enough advance warning before it happens that they can train themselves to do the third stage. Whereas in the Polish case, bang, it happened. And uh, I remember a lot of people s uh, talking about France during World War II and saying, you know, did they do wrong to, def to try to fight back against the Germans? And they said, no, ils ont été lancés. They were plunged into it. They had no opportunity to do anything else. Okay, well, I'll, let me tell you what I was going to do. And then since we have all this equipment here, we have to do something else. I wanted to go over those two and a quarter pages about the overthrow of Maximiliano Hernández Martínez uh, and give you an ex – to do that for two reasons, fill in the background about what this era was like on this – in this hemisphere and also to go over the details that we can get out of Patricia Parkman's description of the event. So what we're going to do instead, because this is an hour video, it's called The Good War and Those Who Refuse to Fight It. It's uh, about World War II conscientious objectors in the U.S. What we're going to do is we'll just see the video and as, you, as you're watching it, just make note of anything salient, salient in your mind that you think is worthy of comment. Then what I'll do is I'll talk about the things to get out of the Patricia Parkman essay to give you an example of how to use reportage to get nonviolent information out of it. And then I'll turn it over to you to say what did you notice in this movie. The dynamics, any interesting comments. Okay, the point of the movie is that uh, this was the most inspiring patriotic war that the country has ever fought. It is still a model for every war that the country fights, this country. That's why President Bush Sr., when he launched the uh, merciless bombing of Iraq in 91, he, s he said – he went on the air and said, the liberation of Kuwait has begun. Now why did he do that? Because he wanted people to think that this was World War II and we were liberating Europe from the Nazis. And people do think that because people think what is comfortable for them to think, I'm afraid. That's, that's a problem that we're going to have to deal with a lot. So here you had the most um, engaging war that the country could possibly be fighting. It looked as if we were suddenly attacked by these two other countries. Don't get me started on what actually what was going on and what George Bush's grandfather was doing with Hitler. That will have to be another seminar somewhere. Uh, and it, it takes me several hours to cool down after I tell that story, so <laughs> we're not going to get into it here. But let's – most people in the country thought that America was in innocent and it just being uh, – was under attack. And yet there were 6,000 people who felt that they would rather go to jail than to fight even in that war. And that's what this film is about. Okay, so John, could you know how to get it started and just push play? I think I can do that. Okay, this is the one. Okay. Okay.
Thank you. So I was saying that David Dellinger and a lot of these other people became parts of a, a loose movement. It never was an organization, but a movement called Radical Pacifism, and it fed the anti-war movements uh, in you know, Korea, Vietnam, and sort of it's a little bit hard to see where it is right now. Um, one thing that always strikes me when I see this movie is Steve Carey saying at the beginning that you knew that there was this horrible menace. You knew that war was the wrong answer, but you did not have another answer. This is the really tremendous importance of nonviolence. If we could get people to understand it, how it applies in every conceivable situation, that is the other answer. And it's, an, it's of course, it's an extremely noble thing to refuse to go along with the wrong answer. But unless you can come up with the right answer, it's really not going to turn the world around. Uh, okay, so what else? What, what did you notice? What comments or what developments? Shannon? Yes, that was David Dellinger. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly uh, how I reacted to that too. You know, here we have this idea that you have to be willing to lay down your life. Here's someone, David Dellinger, who is not in a position of uh, in a situation of immediate risk. And yet mentally, he completely goes through the possibility of what if he died. And he comes, he comes out of it very much like what uh, Dan Ellsberg did. Okay, if I'm willing to do it. Okay, I'm willing to do it. Then what? And then his whole life is enriched actually. And then he feels that he's very much empowered. This is not to be confused with throwing your life away. It's certainly not to be confused with uh, – taking it or anything like that. But as you say with the detachment, Shannon, say if, if you stop clinging to your personal life, an amazing amount of power comes into your hands. I'm, I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying if A, then B. Yeah, Sid. Yeah. And they went to jail and, you know, they probably like the force or what they believe in. Right. Right. This, this for me is really the most important point in the film and there's kind of two stages to it. First, the government uh, tries to punish them or show them that they're doing the wrong thing by congregating them in prison. And what you have is these 7,000 men who were – hardly knew each other. In most cases, didn't know each other at all. They became a movement, and in two stages, they were able to. They had. We were forced to work through their convictions and really think about it. It's not just a gut reaction, a knee-jerk reaction anymore. But why am I in here? And you have to face that with all these other people. And out of that crucible, Bill Sutherland uses a very good word there. Out of that crucible, they really became a movement. And now, what you're saying, uh, Sid, and I completely agree with it, is. Okay, even if you don't have a positive alternative, if you can say no to the wrong answer, a positive alternative will slowly develop out of that. And it's amazing how they see these opportunities coming up for them. The entire uh, NIMH, you know, the National Institute of Mental Health, they've never funded me, but still, they're a pretty good outfit. Uh, it's a part of American life now, and it came out of this, this one decision of these few people insisting on doing something useful. Finally, they plug them into these bedlams. And, you know, we, we grow up not having any idea what those places were like and what kind of a, a blot against humanity it was to have them in every state. So there's the NIMH, there's the radical pacifism movement, and then there's the desegregation of the federal prison system. All not now imagine how much more powerful it would have been if these people had planned that ahead of time. They had known that they could go forward towards these things rather than just away from these things. Well, I don't know. Some of the best things that have ever been accomplished by nonviolence have been more or less by accident. 
just say, once you make the one right choice, everything else follows. Yeah, anything else? Yeah, move out. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they still wanted to participate. They weren't anarchists in the sense that they were disavowing any connection with society. And this is, if you remember, when we discussed the rules for civil disobedience, we said that it's, uh, okay, you decide that there's a regulation or a law that you're not going to obey. It goes against your conscience. But you simultaneously decide that you're going to put up with the penalty because you're not against the system. You're not saying, I'm not part of this society. You're playing by the rules that seem right to you but not the ones that seem wrong to you. And if you don't do that, you never purify those rules. And then by contrast, look what we have that statement from Coop. Here we have people being injected with fatal uh, viruses and they're not being told. And he said, I felt helpless because, in fact, I wrote it down. You're powerless when you're part of a big team. So if the big team is playing in the wrong game, you have to decide you're not going to play along with it. And in a way, you're being the most valuable team player for that whole society. Because if you don't do that, the system is just going to keep on gravitating towards more and more convenient and more and more destructive choices. Yeah. Let's see. 45 seconds. Yes. That's right. Yeah, yeah w the, the terms have got to be sorted out. That's why we have a, uh, a, a rather large glossary going up on that website that will try and sort out this vocabulary. I actually think that's a very powerful thing if we can decide what we mean by words like pacifism, nonviolence, conscientious objection. We'll be able to have the kinds of discussion that those guys were having in those charming camps. Okay, think about this film a little bit more and then we'll go over to talk about the Parkman pages and then talk – no, yeah, that's right. That's what we'll do on Thursday. Insurrectionary movements come up, start next week.